What's up and welcome back to Nostalgia Pod, giving you your weekly look at what's going on in pop culture. My name is Pat Sheehan, joined as always by my trusty co-host Dave Martin Swagger. Dave, how you doing, man? Doing well, my friend. Doing well. How are you? Uh, I, I'm I'm curious right now, actually, because I, I didn't talk to you about this yet. I wanted to save it for on the air. That's right. It is November Genuine reactions only. <laughs> November 18th, NBA draft. <laughs> How you feeling about the Knicks tonight? Well, there's some talk of a trade up, and I am not in favor of that. <laughs> Stay put, please. Why would they be giving up re- more resources to, especially in this of draft? all years to trade up? 2020 draft is not the one, and we've known that for a while. Aye, aye, aye. Very frustrating. But we'll see. We'll see. Uh, stay at eight and 23. You'll be fine. You want them to trade down, possibly? Uh, no, I think stay where you are. But, God, to trade up and take it will be top, and would be even worse than just taking him if he slipped. Uh, God, I don't want that. I don't <laughs> want that at all. We'll see. There's a lot uh, of movement. Al Horford was just traded. Yeah, I saw that. Um, and, and, Bogdanovich, what nicks the trade or that that trade didn't go through something like that. So, wait, is that right? Yeah, that happened uh, about a half hour ago. I saw the the update from the Athletic. Oh shit! That that trade was put on hold, so to speak. Oh, so, fuck. the NBA Come on Bucks what are you doing? moving and shaking. <laughs> uh, you know the 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 stoppage or like the halt going off has been very entertaining. A lot of speculation. Um, and, you know, Dave, every once in a while, will pop on here with someone a little bit more well-versed in the NBA world than I to give his take. So perhaps just be looking out for that if something interesting happens. But we have a couple of interesting things to talk about this week. So hit that subscribe on YouTube.com slash NostalgiaPod or go to SoundCloud.com slash NostalgiaPod to follow the podcast any way you want to because we're going to be talking about two chains today. Uh, starting in the music world with our guy, Two Chains, who, I mean, I think the last time we talked about him was, I mean, was his album last year, Rapper Go to the League, which is an album Correct. we both found pretty enjoyable. Felt like, hmm, maybe Two Chains uh, has a little bit more uh, range than we thought he did. Maybe his mm-hmm. ceiling's a little bit higher than, than we thought it was. Um, so help me God, his sixth album. Did that? Did it continue that for you, Dave? Yeah, six album, six solo album in eight years for Two Chains. Very, very active. Pretty impressive. Um, you know, of this recent string, Pretty Girls, like Trap Music from 2017, Rapper Go to League last year, and now So Help Me God. This is quite easily my least favorite of the three, and does not, I think, have as nearly as much ambition as Rapper Go to the League does. Let alone trying to meet some of those highs so it's just kind of more of a conventional rap album from two chains with a lot of his trademarks and that's still fine enough for me but yeah i i don't i don't it almost had more of a mixtape vibe to me more than anything else like it it seemed a little uh little uh low low ambition low effort i guess not that that is bad it was fine there's some really good moments like always from two chains, but yeah, not, not nearly as impressive as last year. Yeah. It, it was actually kind of interesting. Cause I think <clears throat> I found a couple of the moments on here really, really fun and exciting. Um, you know, I think a couple of the features were, were really strong, especially features from people I did not expect to enjoy the feature. So that was kind of nice. Um, but overall, I think that mixtape vibe is, is correct because uh, it, it, there's very little cohesion or, or like actual like overall um, perspective on this. Like it's kind of just like song, 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 but not connected in any way. But uh, I did really like the production on a lot of these. Um, and you know, if you if you read through the list of producers on this, I mean, there's there's quite a few well known people, you know, popping off. I mean, we had. Uh, well, Chief Keef obviously was one, but was not who I was going to say first. Um, you know, Mike Will made it, was on Save Me. Um, let's see here. There's one other one that really, oh, Mike Dean, obviously, on Feel Away. So, like, there's a couple of songs where you have some really big producers, and I think the beat stood out even more so than the rapping did for me. Yeah, I would say, yeah, it's funny, because, like, 
when I think about two chains nowadays as an OG who's still like really funny with the punchlines, I think he can de- he definitely still delivers on that, like on gray area old enough to be your daddy young enough to fuck your mama like that shit's yeah. hilarious like <laughs> that comes up really in the track list i'm like yeah he's still got that stuff you know and then to even have the ambition to do something like he did on can't go for that with little don't yeah. Bob, dollar sign which is flipping hall and oats like flipping hall and oats in rap in general <laughs> uh not common <laughs> to say the least so kudos for trying that you know it's uh it's it's, it's fine i think at the end of the day and uh will duval really having a big feature way after his moment in the sun has passed but that's that's all good i guess that's still, that was funny to me uh how'd you feel about kanye of course kanye and feel away coming off two features off ty dolla signs album from a few weeks back as well so if we've got a, a bunch of new kanye of late this one will also be featuring brent fias yeah i actually thought this kanye feature was pretty good uh, i felt like he came in pretty smoothly and um you know, I I wouldn't say he's anywhere near what he used to be. I don't think he's even dropping really that memorable lines. And, and maybe that actually speaks more to how low the bar is for him now for me. But the fact mm-hmm. that he came in, he had a great flow and just kind of like gave a solid, unmemorable verse. I was like, oh, nice showing, Kanye. Like, didn't embarrass yourself. So I'll, I'll go there. How, how did you feel about it, though? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, considering... uh it's way better than that loose track he just put out. Um, fuck, what's that called? The one, the one has the uh, the remix has a uh, the baby on it as well. I forgot the song. I thought that was pretty terrible. That recent track from from Kanye. So this <laughs> this might be a little older, to be honest. Like this might be something that, you know Two Chains has had or yeah. had on the hard drive for a bit. Obviously, as their Two Two Chains has long been a good music uh, affiliate, if not an official signee. And I thought what immediately jumped out to me about this album when we found out about it is it was supposed to come out like a month ago. Uh, the, the title, So Help Me God, notably one of the abandoned uh, Kanye album titles, you know, mm-hmm. after uh, follow-ups to Yeezus and, and uh, you know, pre the name Yandi. Like, this is, this is one of those discarded names from Kanye. And who knows, he made an album in full that we never hear. But I always thought that was a good name for, like, that thematic uh, continuity from Kanye. So it's still kind of cool to see it uh, continued in some fashion from uh, a colleague of his. I wouldn't say that the you know that kind of theme really translates again on this album as we said it's really more of a mixtape vibe with just a bunch of tracks but uh i think like most two chains projects there's at minimum plenty to like here uh but yeah i mean it's 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 definitely not his best yeah what would the the tracks be that you might point people to for this album yeah so i mentioned gray area as as Uh a solo track and can't go for that just for yeah, that kind flip. of like trying stuff. I think for just like a, a rap cut, I thought Ziploc was pretty good. I like Kevin Gates yeah. on that. Um, Free Lighter. I, I actually thought Chief Keef was pretty good on that uh, with Uzi as well. So I think those would be my favorites. But towards the back half, some of those other tracks didn't really do a whole lot for me. The, the album kind of pittered out. Yeah, actually, I think by the time we got to like Vampire, I was like, okay, I think that's enough. We could have cut this to about 38 minutes, probably <laughs> been pretty yeah. concise. I, I think you kind of nailed it. I, I did want to ask real quick, uh, Little Wayne, did you like his feature? Where, where are you at with Wayne? He might be going to jail for quite a while. Yeah, I feel like I've heard that before, though. Like, is he really going to go to jail? <laughs> like, unlikely. But yeah, yeah, he's facing some some new charges as a as a felon. Not not great yeah. for him. Um. Yeah, like Lil Wayne is like Eminem to me these days. Even if he actually is kind of good, I'm just like so biased and like over it with him that I just turn my ears off, I feel like. But he's still technically proficient and energetic, you know? That's something, I guess. Yeah, uh, I-, I felt kind of the same way I did about Kanye, where I was like, ah, the bar has been lowered so so low for Lil Wayne that this like serves as like a, a passable verse, yeah. which is it's just really sad, like... Um, you know, it, it's kind of amazing that both of them had the runs that they had, but just to like still be doing what they're doing now, it's a little. Uh, well, it actually, it's an interesting uh, comparison with Two Chains himself because Little Wayne, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, Little Wayne is younger than Two Chains. Little Wayne is 38, and Two Chains is what early 40s, I think. Two yeah. Chains is 43, and Two Chains just feels leagues uh, better and coherent and in command of his artistry than Wayne these days you know totally yeah no that, that, that's a really good point yeah I think 
two chains knows exactly who he is right now you know like he's he's not going to ever create like a my beautiful dark twisted fantasy but like you said he's gonna drop in with, with a verse here and there and drop a line or two that's memorable and get out and mm-hmm. some sometimes it, it, just knowing your lane is more important than anything else so and i will say uh probably what, a month ago a month plus at this point he was at a joe biden campaign stop referred to the this upcoming administration as different and then performed his classic i'm different which i thought was awesome because that song is a classic yeah that is a that is a classic um why don't we move on though to tv and something uh tv show that i'm not sure if it's quite a classic and i'm actually interested to see if this is even going to be a show you think is good industry on hbo um the uh the newest uh hbo uh, mini series, uh, eight episodes created by Mickey Mickey Down and Conrad K. Um, you know, looking at basically like stock trading and and the mm-hmm. the Wall Street of, yeah. of London investment so banking, I think yes. specifically investment banking in, in London and you know, starring like a lot of people people don't know, which is kind of cool too. That this uh, has a lot of young stars, uh, headlined mostly by. My Hala Herald. Yep. My Hala. My Hala. Herald. My Hala. Yes. yes. Yeah. I know they, the exclamation point threw me off. Um, as Harper, mm-hmm. who's like this new intern or, or new hire, and kind yeah, of they're like make they're like life. recent grad. I think I think I think that the the pilot pitch is pretty effective, right? There are all these recent grads that fought tooth and nail to get a start at this prestigious fictional investment bank in London. And now they're on in the six month like trial period where it's they'll find out based on their performance if they're actually hired as full time permanent employees, and that pressure cooker uh, is mm-hmm. immediately turned all the way up as we see in the first episode, first two episodes. So I think that like initial hook of like just kind of being thrown into this high stakes financial world as someone in their young twenties, like I f- I think that's really effectively communicated right away. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean me and you we're not we're not veterans of the uh, of high finance or anything but i think it's notable that mickey down and conrad k who are first time showrunners are actually veterans of that world so Mm -hmm. they seem to kind of be bringing really some semblance of of realism or expectations you know i I think the show definitely is going for it all pretty quickly but i I, i've been entertained so far i'm I'm curious to see more because it's a little different of a vibe it's not like you can just pin this down as oh that's succession you know it's uh i think because and it's it's also not as comic as like wolf of wall street right it's almost more like i don't know like societal right like they kind of like they're kind of like examining their lives and what they're doing in this pursuit of money and what they're doing to themselves like i don't know how deep it'll actually get and if it'll achieve all these things but i I like how it started yeah i I do think that the setup is effective i think i almost want to see more of stuff going on at work um because uh, i i don't know i i don't really feel super invested in a lot of these characters outside of harper um you know there's uh there's a lot of different things going on right so you have the the one guy who's like a total party like party playboy basically is yeah, going out every literally night. just ketamine in the first episode yeah and then goes to a work meeting the next day <laughs> like good luck man yeah <laughs> insane but i also feel like that's probably fairly realistic knowing some people yeah. in, in this world in new york city um you know and and uh you know kind of looking at, at these other ones like there's the, the the gay couple that's kind of secret about their relationship and mm-hmm. seem to be kind of having some weird i don't know ups and downs in that relationship not really sure where they're at with each other um there's the the girl who is uh feeling uh un, unattended to or uncared for by her boyfriend and is kind of flirting with this guy at work and uh i found that interesting but mm. um you know i don't really find myself like caring too much about these characters but the time i do care is things like harper totally crushing the the pitch at dinner and and like the after effect of that yeah or or the the scene where they're at the the party after um after the second episode and that one guy is like being a total dick and harper like stands up to him and then uh, her mentor steps in i think his name's eric uh steps in and it's like those are the moments when i'm like all right this is like i'm i'm in it i'm watching right now the other times like kind of just like the back and forth i'm not like 
super into yet. Maybe that will come along further, but I'm wondering if you have that same investment or if I'm... Yeah, I think by Harper by far is the character you had the most investment in. Like, I'm already, like, feeling the the dread about when they inevitably find out about her uh, falsified college transcript. Shout out, right. shout out to Suni Binghamton, by the way. Um, <laughs> like, they're, they're laying a lot on with her, right? Like, oh, she also happens to be a black person at, at in this predominantly white workplace. It's notable that there's a lot of diversity in the, in this fictional firm, mm-hmm. and that's great for on-screen representation, you know. Um, but I don't I don't actually know how realistic that is for investment banking. Um, but yeah. like, it's very noticeable, right? There's like a, like a, a, a lot of like diversity uh, on the front. Yet she's still facing uh, or hearing about people having kind of more stereotypical like racist thoughts about her employment and her qualifications and stuff so we'll see again we'll see how far they take that kind of stuff um i definitely liked ken leung as eric her mentor um i believe he's a veteran of of lost probably most notably but kind of i like that energy he's having right it's like low-key like matthew mcconaughey a little bit yeah wolf of wall street his his famous cameo right where he's like holds her the bat gives her the bat you know don't forget how this feels, blah, blah. You know, he's like, he's, he's going to start pounding his chest soon, I'm sure. Yeah. No, I, I, I think what makes him a little bit more, like, relatable as Eric is he does have that vibe, but also kind of, like, that sweetness, like, that that conversation where he loses that client, right, because he was, like, a, a dick to his wife when they were out on some, some dinner before. Mm-hmm. You can see him, like, actually internalizing that and um, kind of, like, stepping in later. So you kind of see that this is a character who's going to be, like, that, uh, he's a dick at his core, but kind of a nice dick in the long run, which you kind of need, I think, to to succeed in that business in some way. I'm also interested to see what comes back around about the like sexual assault, basically, that happens to Harper in the first episode with that client who she mm-hmm. makes her first sell to. Uh, you know, it's interesting because the first episode is directed by Lena Dunham. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, it sounds like she might have some sort of like producing or like her hand into kind of like what comes out of this moving forward at least in like maybe just a collaboration or yeah whatever role i think she was billed as like a top producer when the show was announced anyway and i wonder if if that's gonna come back around at some point or that's just kind of gonna be a one-off as like something that women in in this industry deal with um i don't know it kind of just like came and went and wasn't ever really addressed again so a lot to like there's a lot of balls in the air i'm just interested to see which ones they actually hit on which ones they don't right and then you think about uh her her colleague her fellow new grad uh yasmin right she's facing kind of blatant misogyny whereas harper really isn't seeing that from her co-workers they already kind of mentioned that so there's, there's a lot a lot of like those little grenades we've seen thrown off we'll see how many of them actually blow up in the end um speaking of lena's direction i i, I really liked how that first episode is shot and like the visual style that's continuing the second episode like it's like you 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 feel like you're in a real place like it feels kind of real realistic and like those kind of close-ups on everyone like i i liked i like the visuals we're getting there and then you combine that with like kind of like the rhythmic like synths that they kind of throw in Mm -hmm. from like scene transitions and stuff like i I think i think the vibe is is setting in nice you know and also I, i i like i remark on this a lot with with like business related shows when they do it but industry doesn't like hold your hand about knowing like what the fuck those finance jargon terms mean right just go with it because not to the point the the vibe and the feeling and the themes are communicated well and that's actually what's important for the audience and and for the success of the show so like that right like i don't know what the fuck five beeps means right but please keep saying it It sounds great yeah no i i agree i i think I think there's a lot to like about this show. I'm hoping right around like the middle of the season, it really hits its stride and takes off for a great final stretch. I'm yeah. hopeful about it. So any last thoughts before we move on to some movies? Uh, there was a Joji Gimme Love Drop in episode two, was it? Yep. One or two? Episode uh, two. Again, we've remarked that HBO <laughs> dropped the ball not using a Joji song for Run, the title track, the title song. Yet they used it in this. Uh, man, what could have been? Also, I really like Eric. He had this line one of his first scenes where he's like talking about going to the restaurant Nobu. Then he like clarifies to go pre oh eight Nobu. It's like man, <laughs> like you can tell that there's a lot of t- there's a lot of care I think to, yeah. to the finance vibe going on. So I- I'm in. 
Um, we'll, we'll be checking back with that as the season winds down. But why don't we move on to a uh, movie that just came to video on demand? Dave, did you see this one in theaters though? Personal history of David Copperfield. I, I I wanted to actually. It was it was one of the first movies to like open back up theaters like the week mm-hmm. before Tenet came out, and it it left the theaters around me kind of quickly, and like I had been strategic like looking to go last minute when no one would be around and next thing i know it really wasn't playing by me anymore mm. and it was all like reruns of like you know hocus pocus and jurassic park and shit you know so <laughs> i never, i wanted to see it and i didn't actually get to it so i waited till vod as well it just came out yesterday well and now that you've seen it do you think dev patel as the title character david copperfield is a good casting do you think he brings something to this movie that uh really elevates it to being a good movie <laughs> i I, th- I think he's good casting dev patel i think it just kind of has a winning energy to him and uh that's actually one of the things i liked most about the personal history of david copperfield was just how kind of whimsical and like good natured it was mm-hmm. and dev can bring a lot of that you know dev was kind of set up to have a big summer. He would have, he had two leading roles at the theater this year, and because David Copperfield was supposed to come out in May in the theater, and then soon followed after with A twenty four's Green Knight, which he also is the lead. So tough, tough stuff for Dev there. But uh, yeah, I, I liked him a lot. I think he because he 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 was able to play off the kind of stacked ensemble cast well as his character kind of goes through the motions. But I think overall the movie left me a bit underwhelmed. I had higher expectations for this because I knew it was well-liked at a TIFF last year. And this is the second movie from Inuchi after Death Stalin, which I really loved. And I think I was expecting more humor. Um, like m- I think more obvious humor. Like, there's funny moments in this movie, but it's almost like more subtle. It's more like background stuff. You know, it's not like it's pointed at precise jokes the way Veep or Death of Stalin are, you know? Um, and that kind of left me a little disappointed. Yeah, you know, I, 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 there's something that just was not hitting for me with this. Um, I thought Dev Patel was was really strong. I mean, he's just one of the, I think one of the best working actors we have right now. Um, but I, I do think like that whimsical nature of it, and it's obviously told also as like a recounting of a story. So there's parts that are played up, and and you know. Uh, very like interesting setup where like you'll even see like lines put on a screen to kind of like bring you into a different part of the story a different act things like that Um, and I think in in just kind of like processing out loud the the part that I found myself not really um, vibing with was there was this like almost like uh, I don't know like young adult uh adolescent feeling to it that i i almost felt like this was a movie that almost could have been made for kids if a couple mm. of things had been like changed <laughs> you know a little too familiar to you know, enola holmes in the beginning, yeah a, a little bit and i i think i just was kind of left like uh is this movie really for me i don't i don't really know uh, and i also do think my expectations be this being an ianucci movie um were as you said for something that was going to be a little bit more like snappy a little bit more like chippy and it wasn't really that no and so obviously this is based off of david copperfield the famous charles dickens novel Mm -hmm. have you read that one i have not read david copperfield like i knew the name i obviously knew it was one of his big titles but like i I wasn't familiar with it like you know tale of two cities oliver twist christmas carol i feel like he has more famous works oh for sure um for the amount of times I've read the other ones, I, I, I can't recall if I read this. The story doesn't ring a bell to me. And, you know, obviously it's about this like orphan, um, mm-hmm. you know, or child that was orphaned and sent all around, goes on these adventures, you know, yeah. comes, comes with an author, things like that. So I think like, you know, kind of the trials and tribulations of youth and the coming of age stuff, that's probably from the source material as far as we know what we know about Dickensian works. Right. So it doesn't feel like Iannucci reinvented the wheel all that much obviously there's colorblind casting throughout this which i I really enjoyed because again dev patel is a very winning presence obviously Mm -hmm. leading man uh type actor and you have really funny like supporting work from people like benedict wong for example Mm -hmm. who i thought was just really funny as this 
drunk fuck, you know, <laughs> like uh, throughout. Uh, I really like the casting, but yeah, I yeah, I yeah. was let down because this is something I'd really been looking forward to, um, you know, and it, it's it had been in limbo, you know, because this was a movie that was put out in the U.S. by uh, Searchlight, formerly Fox Searchlight. And it mm-hmm. been in limbo since the Fox acquisition. And everyone's kind of wondering, what's Disney going to do with this movie? Are they going to dump it on Hulu? Are they going to sell it to someone else? And they're like, ah, you know, we'll just send it off to die uh, when theaters open up. And I actually looked, it made like 13 million or so worldwide. Wow. I think 12 million of that or 11 million of that was world, uh, not in the US. But mm-hmm. uh, so it made, it made a little bit of money. But yeah, yeah it, it, I, I just felt like. I don't know, like, uh, the plot just kind of lost me a little bit. Like, I just had a hard time being interested. <laughs> yeah. And, and, like, again, like, all, all the parts that I knew about it coming in, and, and even, like, scene to scene, I'm usually kind of entertained, but, you know, th- this is obviously set in Victorian England, but, like, if I want something like that, I, I almost wish it had, like, a real sense of humor the way Emma does. The Jane yeah. Austen adaptation from earlier this year. So, yeah, it, it, um, it let me down. You know, I, I've been trying to think of what movie the like I get the vibe of from this, and it the movie I think that comes to me is um, the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, but like the newer one, the Giant oh, Depp. It geez. gives me that feeling oh, of, of like before they go to like the Chocolate Factory, you know. And I, I mean that that one's a little bit dingier. This one's a lot more like brighter and whimsical, like you said. But just kind of like the overall like the beats to it, and just like the the general sense of what they're going for feels like that. And, um, you know, I think especially when you have as many talented people working on this, I mean, you have Tilda Swinton, Benedict Wong, like you talked about Ben Wishaw. Mm-hmm. Um, it, there's a lot of big names. Hugh Laurie. Yeah. Hugh um, Laurie. Obviously I forgot. Peter Capaldi um, and Gwendolyn Christie. Like it's, it's truly loaded. Yeah. You, you expect this to, to be something you're going to be talking about a lot. And in the end, I feel like this is just pretty, forgettable in a lot of ways which you know thinking about Iannucci coming off of Stalin you know and and then beep ending goes to Avenue 5 and this just Mm -hmm. that's not not moving in the right direction no no sir um you know going back to Benedict Wong though the moment when he keeps trying to get a drink and they uh, Tilda Swinton's character keeps like stopping him and then Hugh Laurie and David Copperfield run by it like oh just have a drink like I know how much you love this <laughs> yeah and he gets, that was one of my favorite moments of the whole thing yeah I, I also like the bit about how uh David just lets people call him whatever he wants and his nickname <laughs> changes like every like 20 minutes like yeah uh, you know stuff like that like some of the continuity with the characters I think is done well but the over I think the overall narrative I just thought it would grab me more than it ended up doing yeah and I, I think because of that the third act um really fell flat for me um found myself just like wanting the movie to be over unfortunately which you know um not they they can't all be hits right dave that's right that's right we tried but i'm wondering was the nest uh the the newest uh movie featuring carrie coon and jude law in the starring roles uh directed by sean durkin was this a hit for you uh, it's also like an incomplete for me Okay. Um, I think the nest starts really, really strong, but also fizzled out a little bit, unfortunately. But you can also tell that there's just more competent filmmaking at the helm, right? Mm-hmm. Like no shots at Ianucci, but Sean Durkin. This is only a second film. His first film from almost ten years ago was a big Sundance hit, and this also premiered. Sun Nest also premiered Sundance earlier this year. But just from the jump with the nest, you you watch like those camera pans, you notice the like piano score drops at times. And like, you can tell there's a lot of like care going into it. And then of course it's angered by two, I think, really committed performances from Law and Coon. But it's all it was also a plot that didn't surprise me nearly as much as I expected and kind of just fizzled out. And almost bit off more, 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 more than it could chew. There's a lot of side plots in the nest, uh, surprisingly. Um, but I, li- I liked, I liked, uh, I liked enough of it, I guess. What do you think? You know, I, I think the the part that's going to stick with me the most is the the visual style of this. There's so many tight shots sh- uh, from such unique angles. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And there's so much being com- <clears throat> communicated by the actors who aren't doing the speaking um, in this, you know, like uh, I think specifically Carrie Coon in this uh, puts on like a display in terms of her reactions to things, the way that she's responding to some of the bullshit that Jude Law's character is kind of putting out there, yeah. seeing her face. Like I, I, f- I forgot what was exactly happening. I think they were at like a dinner party, like kind of like halfway through the movie. And he's like uh, one of his like people who, uh, Coworkers giving a toast, and I think mm-hmm. she realized like some yeah. lie he had told, and that, her that face was really well done. Just like slowly, like melting, was like devastating, you know. And I was like, "This He's is Carrie Coon, too. so good." Like, yeah, it's like Carrie Coon, like totally like showing out. Um, or like the scene with Jude Law with the the, the cabbie near the end of the movie when the cabbie is mm-hmm. like talking about what we as you know what people being parents needs to do which is try to give a better life and then he's like well, what do you want what, what do you want then he was like i don't know like just like that scene was so well shot and like you know the the cabbie not having a, a face that you can see in the shadows and like really like being this like it, it's metaphorical but like i think it done the tasteful not super over the top way was really really strong like this confrontation of himself almost so um I found some of those moments really good, but overall, I think I found myself feeling a little bit like listless and and almost like expecting something else to happen. Like it had almost kind of like a horror dread vibe to it at at points. And I was like, is there something else going on here? Like, am I missing something? Left me a bit confused at times. Yeah. I feel like the audience is a little ahead of the, the characters at the end of the day, right? Like you realize quickly it's a marriage that's going to fall apart. And the big main source of that is going to be Jude Law is a, playing a character that just spins a yarn. Yep. And it's done in his whole life, evidently. Pathological liar. Yeah. And you've see, you have you see the latest yarn be spun before Carrie Coon's character and other people like actually realize it and openly acknowledge it. So it, I, it, it felt too simple at the end of the day for me. And you know, they, they there's there's some really good scenes between Carrie Coon and Jude Law, but I was kind of expecting like a true like Peter the way like Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver fight in Marriage Story, for example. Like I, I did, there was no like actual big blow up moment. Like mm-hmm. like the separation kind of happens almost mutedly at dinner when she just walks off, and then you get that great scene where she's just dancing her uh, <laughs> anger away <laughs> in yeah. the bar by herself, right? But um yeah it just felt like there was like kind of a spark that we lost at the end of the second act yeah it it was interesting because um i think there's a lot of a lot of like undertones and subtle messages that are trying to be portrayed by durkin here and you know i think the one that fell most flat for me is whatever was going on with the the son who almost feels like an afterthought in a lot of this um it's barely in the movie but then at times feels like he's playing like such a crucial avatar in this, you know, like um, they have, uh, they have this moment where uh, near the end, Carrie Coon comes home and the house is a mess and he's like locked in this room. And it's just like, yeah, I locked, uh, you know, I locked myself in because there was a party going on. It's like, uh, okay, like <laughs> what am I supposed to, and then he's the one that's running out and like consoling his mom and she's like digging up a dead horse. It just kind of felt very like the son, wasn't I, I didn't get the purpose of what they were trying to say what he was going through i think the oldest daughter made a little bit more sense but that was you know samantha's story line like side plots were almost um i feel like a little too over the top where she was like getting pretty heavy into drugs um and pretty quickly it seems like in, in their time there so um you know just a, there's a lot going on you know like you said and i, I think uh to varying degrees of effectiveness yeah, you know, it's funny. You you think about this, you think about industry, right? And like, if you're not paying attention, you almost don't realize that this movie's a period piece. It's set in the 80s. Yeah. And like the, the lack of internet, the lack of Zoom is very present in like, you know, all the Jude Law's decision making, right? He's like, mm-hmm. we're going to move the family so I can work at this London firm. And like, it's a big deal that they're out at the countryside and not in downtown London, right? And his whole like, you know, you like, 
I feel like the first the first moment where I was like, oh, this guy might just kind of be a schmuff was when he's like talking about like regulation and how we need more deregulation. <laughs> it's like you could tell he's a very like singular focused person, and and he, the pontification he does about um, making your fortune selling like commodities or whatever kind of trader he was. It's like, oh yeah, this is very like Gordon Gecko ass, like the lionization of yep. the, of Wall Street and the stock market international writ large you know it's like huh and yet like i like there's really nothing redeeming about jude law's character besides the meta nature of the good performance right so it's like again i I think i think the ness is just kind of missing missing something to it but it's still very watchable because there's two really good performances and it's still uh, well made like like you know when they're at that like really fancy mansion that they move into and they're all like i fucking hate this house it's creepy it's scary and i'm like oh well i mean i I live there if you guys don't want to like the house looked fucking sick to me and and led Led zeppelin apparently recorded an album there so i would i would definitely (laughs) at least go and stay a while but uh you know just speaking to the 80s vibe you talked about um i really like the soundtrack here you know you had uh shaka khan heart the psychedelic furs the cure i mean uh really really choice and uh, it reminded me that, that these dreams by heart is probably one of like the uh, like og soft rock hall of famers man like w- what a fucking jam that is so um you know the the nest some good some bad little little mix uh, in between but uh now we're going to talk about things that are pretty much only good or are they because with the grammys can you ever really say that they're making the right choices in terms of what's good and what's not um it just degrees it's never yeah. this or that with the grammys unfortunately and dave this is going to be a, i feel like a really interesting grammys year because uh and, you know just reading through kind of like the the potential like people who are up for for things this year it, it's really all over the map like we're talking about harry styles fine line is still up which feels like it came out a decade ago <laughs> oh i got i i got thoughts on that my friend um and i i feel like I, I know what you're gonna say but we'll get to that you know the box by roddy rich is is this uh, yeah and, and roddy rich's album is all over these potential nominations too and it's like these songs feel like forever ago and then well and and, and well that's actually what i want to get to is the eligibility period for the uh, upcoming grammys which will be happening on january 31st was september 1st 2019 until august 31st 2020 like every year, that's what, uh, f- about four months, nine, mm-hmm. 10, 11, 12, one, if four months in between cutoff and ceremony. And thus, that leaves you with albums at the next Grammys that feel old and from a different like year. The, gr- the Grammy calendar never makes sense. So let's just think about what albums from 2000 freaking 19 are eligible at the Grammys this year. Harry Styles' Fine Line, Roddy Rich, two of the big contenders, but also Post Malone, Brittany Howard, FKA Twigs, Kanye West, Jesus is King, Camila Cabello, Charlie XCX, the other album for 2019, not to mention the one she dropped this year, Coldplay, uh, yeah. Sergio Simpson. Like it's these albums feel sense. feel old because they are, and <laughs> and and Post Malone, his album came out one week after Lana Del Rey's album, but Lana Del Rey made the cutoff, so we she was nominated at the, at the ceremony we already had. It's like, oh man, like they gotta fix this calendar. It's bad. It's just it's yeah. it, it's it does nothing for anyone. It, it, it's not instruct uh, instructive, you know, like the box yeah. from Roddy and Harry Styles, like those songs did permeate into this year, right? I acknowledge yeah. that. But I, I just don't I just don't think it, it it's a smart way to organize this. It almost feels like the recording academy like we have to have a cutoff that's far enough away that we can make these decisions. But like movies and TV, it's not nearly as big a gap for Emmys and Oscars. So you got to fix this shit. Yeah. And you know, the, the natural thing feels like making like January 1st, the cutoff or even December 1st, because most of the time you're not getting many like big albums between December and middle of January. That's kind of when they, they yeah. it starts back up. So it almost feels like there's like a built-in thing, but you know, if, if we know anything about the Grammys, that's to like shoot themselves in the foot. Um, I, I was thinking, why don't we start with uh, probably the category I'm most interested to talk about, which is 
best new artist. Oh God, it's another one. <laughs> you know, l- looking through this category, I mean, the people on here that are being considered as a best new artist, people like Megan The Stallion, Phoebe Bridgers, uh, Moses Sumney, Pop Smoke, uh, Black Pink. I mean, literally, people have been putting music out for quite some time now. Yeah. He, so I had similar thoughts. So I decided to look up what the fuck the criteria is for best new artist. And the criteria, like everything with the Grammys changes over time, titles change, blah, blah, blah. But right now, it's an artist must have released a minimum of five singles slash tracks or one album. Uh, okay. Or, and also, <laughs> sorry, they may not have been entered into this category more than three times. You can be nominated for best new artist multiple times, which feels very antithetical to me. Megan mm-hmm. Thee Stallion notably was nominated last year and was not selected. She, why was she nominated last year? Because for Criteria 3, must have achieved a breakthrough into the public consciousness and impacted the musical landscape during the eligibility period. I don't know. Didn't Megan Thee Stallion create a meme with Hot Girl Summer and mm-hmm. have a ton of viral success last year off of <laughs> Fever Mixtape, which was great? Yes. Yes, that yeah. happened. <laughs> why is she still a new artist? Yeah, it, it, it's idiotic. And then, like, you even think of someone who's a little less famous, like Phoebe Bridgers. Um, she's been incredibly impactful in indie rock for several years now, about as impactful as it gets these days. Yep. So why is yeah. she new? Doesn't make sense. I mean, even looking through, even further down the list, um, King Princess put on an album, I believe, like two years ago that was really well regarded. Kay Trinata has definitely two albums that are top notch, and he's just now a new artist. You know, uh, and you think Joji. of the calendar, right? Like, uh, Kay Trinata's last album came out, what, early de- la- December 2019, I think it was, mm-hmm, the last one? Like that, yeah. But that was his second album. Mm-hmm. Shouldn't that cut us off already? Like, yeah. It's... Uh, was it 99.9% or whatever the first one was called? That that should have been it. That that should that was the eligibility period. We Second album from Kay Trinata? No, sorry. You're not new anymore. Yeah. People it's... like you. People, people talk about Kay Trinata. <laughs> he's, he's, he's made it. He's not new. It's it's uh, definitely just feels very nonsensical and just kind of random. But um, who who do you got? Who do you think yeah. will will get the nominations for this category? Right. So along those lines, there's been talk that like they're kind of fudging the criteria for <laughs> this year. So it seems like they're gonna put Megan Thee Stallion in whatever. Yep. Anyway, seems like Megan Thee Stallion's in the mix. Phoebe Bridgers mm-hmm. feel safe. Uh, Summer also, Walker. Summer Walker. Doja Cat. Mm-hmm. They, they make sense you know i'd I like to see uh rena uh sawayama you know she's really popular but not nearly as famous that'd be really anything inspired pick they've expanded this category to include eight people so i think that's a wide breadth of recognition mm-hmm. especially if you pick actual kind of new people and not like certified stars already like megan but yep. um you know i, I saw people throwing out joji another one that would love my, that made my eyebrows raise a new but i guess right. he's still kind of new going to this criteria so that that'd be great you know, like um, Fike fits as well. And I think the big one is, will they nominate Blackpink for yeah. Best New Artist? Blackpink played Coachella in the spring of 2019, but I think they still count. And, you know, they haven't released a whole lot of music for what that's True. worth, but they're global superstars already. But they definitely really want this recognition. So, you know, tough to tough to say that they don't actually count. Yeah, you know, you named off a lot of the ones I had. A couple I just wanted to throw out there. And and this one, maybe I'll start by asking you. Pop Smoke, think he's going to get that nom? Yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> Best New Artist kind of has an aura of, you know, the, the prequel Star Wars meme. You'll watch mm-hmm. your career with great interest. Yeah. Well, you can't do that with Pop Smoke. He's passed. <laughs> like, right. I, I think that that's kind of disrespectful, actually. Mm-hmm. It's, like, it's like a backhanded compliment. But because if again, there's... Pop Smoke made cultural impact last year in rap, mm-hmm. but the Grammys didn't notice that, of course. But if if there's one thing we know about the Grammys, that they will do something that will put their foot in their mouth. I could see that, this being it. Um, I, I actually am going to predict that Morgan Whalen, who's been a uh, rising young country star, mm-hmm. you know, we, we talked about him a couple of weeks ago because he was supposed to perform on SNL and didn't follow COVID regulations. Um, he's He's been rising i think he'll he has a good shot and also phineas you know last year billy eilish cleaned up and phineas was up there with her and i, I just get the the sense that they're gonna probably want to get the eilish people involved in some way yeah yeah i was thinking like 
in other categories. Billy had some loose singles come out during this year that would feel awfully hand fisted to me to give like top tier award nominations to. Mm-hmm. And Phineas is kind of the same way. Like this is not an acknowledgement of Phineas's songwriting and production ability that he does for his sister. This would be him as a solo artist and mm-hmm. he has only a handful of songs to his name, but also right. they haven't made actually that much of an impact. Like the criteria of best new artist impact. I don't think Phineas, the solo act has actually uh, deserved, earned that in my opinion. No, I, I agree, but um, I, I could see the Grammys just yeah. wanting to get that name up there. Honestly, I'd be happy with this category. Uh, you know, if outside of Megan and, you know, Phoebe Bridgers, we kind of expect to get nominated. If we get Moses Sumney and black pink in there in some way, put whoever else you want in there like recognize like the real talent um all right why don't we move on to a different category why don't we do um we do best rap album you know i think it's uh interesting because when Mm -hmm. looking through this category uh, the first question that comes to mind for me is how many posthumous nominations will we get here you know we have mac miller um, who I think might have a shot. Uh, Juice World is mm-hmm. potentially in the mix here. Um, you know, I think if we even look a little little bit further down, there's uh, there's one other that came to mind that I'm not yeah. seeing. Right and Pop now. Smoke, of course. Yes, Pop Smoke. Thank you. Um, so, well, how many do you think we're gonna get? Zero, one, two. Mac Miller was notably nominated for Swimming, the previous grant or two Grammys ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, two Grammys ago, and. I could see that, but I'm I, I'm gonna say no. I, I think think about the spots, right? Like Roddy Rich, clearly a lock mm-hmm. for this category. No problem with that. RTJ run, run the jewels four better freaking get nominated. They, I don't think I RTJ think three win. was even nominated if I remember right. But like, I I think that that's pretty safe. Also, little babies, my turn. Not as high on that album as a lot of people, but I think that's pretty safe given the year little babies had. Megan the Stallion, Sugar, maybe. I'd rather they just recognize the the songs from her, like Savage. I expect to get nominated. I don't know if you need to acknowledge that project, but mm-hmm. maybe you know since of the, well the campaign does. Obviously, her her technical debut album comes out this Friday, um, so that leaves you at a few more spots, right? I think Roddy, RTJ, Little Baby for sure, maybe Megan. That leaves you with one or two more. Um, I think Pop Smoke is right there, given how big that album has been. Same thing for Juice World. Uh, and then I think the other, only other big contenders, probably Uzi with Eternal Take. That means that Freddie Gibbs, Alfredo, doesn't get in. That means they don't pick DaBaby from last year. Kirk, which no. that's fine with me. Uh, Logic. <laughs> I, mean, I, I wouldn't mind Logic. Actually, I really liked No Pressure, but it's, it's a tough category. I'm only picking five. Yeah, it is a tough category. I, I hope... My my big hope is that Run the Jewels wins, and if we get one surprise nomination, please make it Alfreda. Like, yeah. please just like or it, one of the Griselda guys, maybe if they pick Benny the Butcher, from some Grace of God. I, that, right. Those albums are not famous enough, but like that would that would be great. I'm not worried about Eminem getting in. I feel like they've <laughs> they've, they've actually stopped doing that. Definitely, just good. Um, I, I'm gonna prove my guy that. Polo G to get it, but I don't think that's yeah. happening. My my last prediction is I do think Mac gets nominated for this category and there's like a, a celebration for him, so to speak. I, and I, I think that's part of the thing, right? It's like you have three really high profile posthumous rap albums. Mm-hmm. How do you nominate one over another? Yeah. I, I think I think it's a fine line to walk. I, I think like the differences, um Circles is like known for like being one of the best posthumous albums in terms of taking what was recorded and he had a lot of it recorded but like piecing it together in a way that sounds like a actual album whereas like juice worlds when we talked about it was like pretty disjointed there were some moments where you're like okay juice like had something there but like yeah overall just felt like it was posthumous album and i think maybe they could fudge it uh juice world song with marshmallow come and go pretty big maybe you could put that in like the electronic recording category Mm. Also, I saw some love for Pop Smoke's Dior, which I think technically came out in its original form before the old the cutoff, mm-hmm. but then was re-released two additional times within this period, and we know they're probably going to fudge stuff. So maybe you recognize Dior, and you don't have to nominate the album, like, and then you nominate Mac's album. Like, 
that I think makes sense to me logically, but it, there's there's a lot to it. Yeah, there's a lot to it. Why don't we move on though to uh, pop vocal album? Yeah, this is uh, loaded with names. Yeah, a, a ton of huge names here, and um, you know, there's going to be a couple people that I think get some pretty big snubs. And I want to start though with basically a, a person who very publicly in the last year acknowledged how hurt they were by all the Grammy snubs they had before, and that's Taylor Swift. Mm-hmm. Do you She's expect? Back. Do you expect her to be back in it? Yeah, I mean, Lover was nominated in this category too, which is the bigger sure. ones. That was, but yeah, Folklore for sure is getting into pop vocal album. I think that's actually what makes this one so tough. Is I think there's four really safe picks, and that leaves one, one, one to fight over. Right? You got Taylor Swift's Folklore, The Weekends, After Hours, Harry Styles' Fine Line, and Dua Lipa's Future Nostalgia. That's mm-hmm. four right there. Four heavy hitters. Four huge albums. Uh, for really liked albums, despite what me and you think about the Harry album. And that leaves that fifth one, right? And then uh, on its face, I'm like, oh, is that just Post Malone penciled in right now? But I don't know. I just want to say that Harry album has really grown on me. But uh, we'll, we'll, don't, don't, don't do this to me, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know if it's top 500 albums of all time good, yeah. but it's uh, certainly grown on me. Um, you know, it, it feels like this could be post malone hollywood hollywood's bleeding right there but i have my eye on uh lady gaga i like yeah. i think i think if anyone else can get in there it's probably her my my wish like if i got to pick it you got to put bts in it. and i, I yeah. could see them maybe doing that just to like get that viewership i mean that mm-hmm. would create a lot of online viral moments for them if anything the grammys since they've lost so much legitimacy in terms of people actually caring about them i think just having the most eyes on them is probably the goal in some right. respect yeah i'm hoping bts like maybe like record of the year they could nominate dynamite which d- did get in under the the cutoff okay. um but it's tough right because that fifth that fifth spot post malone bts that leaves really no hope for uh halsey doja cat camilla nope. selena gomez charlie xcx twice um as well as Justin Bieber, who we probably expected to get in this category before we actually heard changes. So <laughs> it, it, it's really loaded. It's really, really loaded. But yeah, I mean, BTS, man, if Map of the Soul 7 was picked, that'd be huge. That would be huge. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping for it. But let's let's move on to a different category. Song of the Year. I have a, I think I have a bit of a dark horse winning this one, so I'll oh. save that for the end. But um, yeah, well, what are the safe ones? Blinding Whites by The Weeknd. Yeah probably don't start now from dua lipa yep um you know th- this, th- this i think those are two those two big ones are probably the box from roddy yeah those feel very safe for both record and song of the year i'm pretty sure and then I there's would, i don't know there's only a handful of other ones that i can really think of like maybe a taylor song gets in here there's a few uh, cardigan ad- adore you probably from harry sure yeah. um circles from post malone yeah it was huge rain on me like those ones immediately mm-hmm. jump out to me I think the the one that probably uh, this is what I'm picking is Marin Morris's yeah. "The Bones" because that 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 track is Popular just pick. everywhere. Um, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's eight to one right now um, on, on betting sites, and that that one just feels prime because uh, again, country music is huge, and that song literally every time I turn on the radio, which I don't do often, I hear it. So yeah, <laughs> country wise, I feel like Marin Morris and after that probably luke combs are probably the most likely to be celebrated um those those two albums are probably the most likely to get into the bit the, the, the top album category album of the year um for record and song of the year i don't know maybe like i mentioned dynamite from bts was already maybe you pick another rap song savage from megan do the remix with beyonce perhaps um rock star the baby and roddy that was a huge huge smash um so so one one aspect I haven't really brought up in terms of storylines is, um, you know, music uh, oftentimes a form of protest and commentary on the the cultural world, and it's something that is usually commenting in real time. Whereas movies and TV often lag behind a year or two based on the time it takes to develop. Music is very current. What are the ch- what are the chances you think a song like "Walking in the Snow" by Run the Jewels, which very clearly is a commentary on an issue in terms of yeah police brutality that's captured the nation this year gets a nomination solely for a reason like that i think that's a good thought but i actually don't think that's the right choice i think well the choice they would make it's the better song 
I think if they're going to do something like that, though, it's Little Baby's The Bigger Picture, <laughs> which was a bigger song. Got a lot, a big pop when it came out right after uh, George Floyd and all that. Yep. But it's a song that's way less pointed and about its message. And it's all, to me, it's actually like a really like yeah. kind of cowardly song that doesn't actually say fucking anything. It's kind of like a both sides bullshit song. Yeah, but I feel like if they're gonna pick something, it's that. Also, given the high profile little baby has had for all of 2020, I haven't been paying like a, a ton of attention to her this year. Um, nope, but she also not. she does have that song "I Can't Breathe," which I I could mm-hmm. see potentially falling in this category. And she's much more beloved and kind of anointed um, over the last couple of years by the Grammy, um, you know, foundation. So. Uh, I could see that getting there. It, it's interesting because I, I see Fiona Apple on here and going with like things that are affecting our current times. I mean, Fetch the Bolt Cutters feels like a pretty safe bet for like album of the year, but I yeah. don't know if there's any song that's going to garner attention off this. You think? No. I mean, yeah. record and song of the year, they don't actually, they don't often do like kind of like under the radar pick. They'll do that with album of the year, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, shit two years ago i forgot who won but like um it, it was that kind of choice so i think the own apple is kind of a lock for like that's the pick right like it's not as mainstream but it's critically adored and all the grand people certainly love it and it's well well deserved so yeah i think fetch the bolt cutters for sure is there but song wise yeah I, I don't think that's super likely yeah uh, okay well it seems like a lot of this is going to be going chalk we're going to be seeing a lot of the weekend here why don't we talk real quick about record of the year um, you know, l- looking here again, the ones that feel safe, um, Dua Lipa, The Weeknd, Post Malone Circle, Savage, Meg, Meg The Stallion, um, probably The Box by Roddy Rich, Rain On Me, uh, Lady Gaga, Adored, probably is somewhere in there. Any others that kind of stand out to you? No, I think it's kind of the same mix, like maybe yeah. a different Taylor song is picked for each category, right? Records. Yeah is more about the production of the overall song. Song of the year is more about the actual songwriting. Hard distinction to make for the average person still, but technically the artist doesn't actually win for record of the year. That is listed as the name, so you know the name of the song. Anyway, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, like I said, I hope uh, BTS could get one of these, but it, I, I find it awfully hard to delineate it, picking what's going for this one and not that one, to be honest. Yeah, I agree. Um... <laughs> I, I don't even really know what I would pick to, to differentiate. I guess maybe like I'm thinking about the song "Rain on Me." Like, there's some production moments in that that stand out. So maybe yeah. that's where I would lean. But sure. you know, I, I bet this will probably go blinding lights if anything. All right, now finally, album of the year. Uh, we mentioned uh, the weekend definitely in there. Fiona, probably Dua Lipa, probably Taylor, probably Harry. I mean. That leaves us with only a couple other ones. What else do you think is going to be in there? Yeah, so from there. I mean, R- R- RTJ seems like it might get RTJ enough. maybe, Post Malone maybe, uh, The Chicks maybe. Oh, I was going to say, I think I think The Chicks are in there, dog. Mary Morris or Luke Combs perhaps. And then then I think, how 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 committed are they to this? Would they pick BTS here? Would they pick Bad Bunny? whose first album he dropped this year was Critically mm-hmm. Adored. Burnham Boy, Twice as Tall. We know that'll get a Best Global Music nomination, the new yep. name for world music. Um, but would they actually acknowledge it in The Big Dogs? As we said la- uh, earlier this year when we talked about the ceremony in uh, January or February, whenever it was, um, a Black person has won Album of the Year like once in the last decade or so, when Bruno Mars won, mm-hmm. um, to even nominate a Bad Bunny or a Burna Boy or BTS is very big change. Yep. Speaks to changing attitudes and a, I think more of a recognition of the global enterprise that is uh, music consumption now. But I'm not super confident about that happens, right? Like for all we know, they would pick a pretty middling Childish Gambino album because we know the Grammys love Childish Gambino. Yeah, you know, it, the, the lack of faith that we have in the Grammys is so disappointing, dude. Because, <laughs> like, uh, you know, a couple of these albums, I think, definitely deserve to be up there. But the fact that, like, you know, uh, 
uh, just scrolling through this list I have in front of me here, something like RTJ or um, yeah, I'm thinking about like the, like Phoebe Bridgers album, like Punisher. Mm-hmm. That feels like one that should be nominated, but the chances of it are very slim. I feel yeah. like you know yeah, you and, just stuck to the genre categories of that stuff. Yeah. Tame Impala, same way. Yeah, it's like you know a, an album that was one of our favorite albums of last year, Magdalene from FKA Twigs. Yeah. Like it's a hundred to one shot. Like this, yep, no chance. So which is so really, really disappointing. <sighs> I don't know, man. Um, hey, who who do you think wins this category in the long run? Dua, Weekend. I don't think Dua's going to win, but I think she's nominated. I think it's Weekend or Taylor Swift, really. Yeah, I'm um, I'm hoping for Fiona. You know, she's, she's very lauded and critically liked, if yeah. not popularly. So if there's that Dark Horse one, it's probably her. I'm expecting Blinding Lights to win at least one of the two Which song is. awards, and that's uh-huh. fine. That That's very deserving. Um, oh, you mean Super Bowl halftime performer of the weekend? I'm super with that, by the way. That's yeah. a great pick. Jay Z really stepping up there, you know he had a big say in that. So <laughs> Pepsi halftime, baby! <laughs> Woo! Feel the excitement. Any last thoughts on uh, on uh, this uh, Grammys nominations? Uh, we'll check in next week, or no, sorry, two weeks. They, these nominations are announced Tuesday. Week. Tuesday, uh, yeah. twenty fourth. Yeah, we'll we'll chime in at some point on what inevitably goes right and wrong, <laughs> but um. Yeah, you know, I honestly like there's a big there's a big pile of people that you you're confident in. I feel like they're going to do like a mostly good job. It's just whether there's a, a a mission here or there that really ticks you off, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it's yeah. not going to be a disaster, but it, there's just going to be disappointment like always. Like always, and uh, hopefully we didn't disappoint you this episode. So if we did, uh, direct all of your tweets at Martin Swagger. And if we didn't, follow at Nostalgia Pod on Twitter, as well as hit the subscribe button on YouTube and go to SoundCloud.com slash Nostalgia Pod. You can follow the podcast that way you want to. Dave, what should people be watching, listening to, consuming for next week? Uh, they should be <laughs> listening to the best new artist nominee, Megan Thee Stallion, dropping her official debut album, Good News, yeah. on Friday, as well as BTS dropping their second album of 2020, B. Um, very excited about those two huge records. Um, I believe one of the Megan tracks is called Shots Fired. So we can hear um, go off on that Tory Tor- Lanes. Lanes. Very excited yep. about that. And we're also getting the start of Steve McQueen's small acts anthology series slash anthology film series kind of like a black mirror some of these are more feature length again the first one on amazon it's bbc and amazon amazon here first one called mangrove which was actually shown at new york film festival and it's supposed to be great so i'm looking forward to that i'm happy that we're getting a five-week run of this as opposed to the black mirror here it is all at once drop that netflix does so that's good and then there's also uh a new movie from anish chiganti who we remember from searching a few years back with john cho his next movie run is a thriller with sarah paulson it's supposed to be really great as well that'll be on hulu on friday a lot of stuff to watch a lot of stuff to listen to stay tuned to nostalgia pod and we'll see you next week